important today as ever, as we continue to bring people together as a catalyst for conversation and innovation. I'd like to take a moment to recognize those of our 324 members of the Centennial Society joining us today as their contributions continue to be the financial backbone of support for the club and help enable us to offer our wonderful, diverse programming now and in the future. A special welcome to members of the Economic Club's 2021 Class of Fellows, a select group of rising next-gen business thought leaders. We'd also like to welcome graduate students from Rutgers University, NYU Stern School of Business, the City University of New York Graduate Center, Columbia Business School, and the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University. Now, it's a great pleasure to welcome back my colleague and esteemed guest of honor today, Jay Powell, a chair of the Federal Reserve System. He took office as chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System on February 5th, 2018, and also serves as chair of the Federal Open Market Committee, the Fed's monetary policy making body. Now, Jay served as a member of the Board of Governors since taking office on May 25th, 2012. Now, prior to his appointment to the Federal Reserve Board, uh, he's a visiting scholar at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C., where he focused on federal and state fiscal issues. And from 1997 through 2005, Jay was a partner of the Carlisle Group. And before that, he served as an Assistant Secretary and as Undersecretary of the Treasury under President George with responsibility for policy and financial institutions, the treasury debt market, and related areas. And prior to joining the administra that administration, Jay worked as a lawyer investment banker in New York City. Now, in addition to his service on corporate <coughs> boards, Jay served on the boards of charitable and educational institutions, including the Bentheim Center for Finance at Princeton University, the Nature Conservancy of Washington, D.C. and Maryland, and he's received his uh, under, undergraduate degree in politics from Princeton University and earned his law degree from Georgetown University, where he was editor-in-chief of the Georgetown Law Journal. Following, the chair, following Chair Powell's address, we'll have a Q&A session with two distinguished questioners from the club. And as a reminder, this conversation is on the record as we have media on the line. So Jay, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I will discuss the state of our labor market from the recent past to the present and then over the longer term. A strong labor market that is sustained for an extended period can deliver substantial economic and social benefits, including higher employment and income levels, improved and expanded job opportunities, narrower economic disparities, and healing of the entrenched damage inflicted by past recessions on individuals' economic and personal well-being. At present, we are a long way from such a labor market. Fully realizing the benefits of a strong labor market will take continued support from both near-term policy and longer run investments so that all those seeking jobs have the skills and opportunities that will enable them to contribute to and share in the benefits of prosperity. We need only look to February of last year to see how beneficial a strong labor market can be. The overall unemployment rate was 3.5%, the lowest in a half century. The unemployment rate for African Americans also reached historical lows. Prime age labor force participation was the highest in over a decade, and a high proportion of households saw jobs as plentiful. Overall wage growth was moderate, but wages were rising more rapidly for earners on the lower end of the scale. These encouraging statistics were reaffirmed and given voice by those we met and conferred with, including the community labor and business leaders, retirees, students, and others we met with during the 14 Fed Listens events we conducted in 2019. Many of these gains had emerged only in the later years of the expansion. The labor force participation rate, for example, had been steadily declining from 2008 to 2015 even as the recovery from the global financial crisis unfolded. In fact, in 2015, prime age labor force participation, which I focus on because it is not significantly affected by the aging of the population, reached its lowest level in 30 years, even as the unemployment rate declined to a relatively low 5%. Also concerning was that much of the decline in participation up to that point had been concentrated in the population without a college degree. At that time, many forecasters worried that globalization and technological change might have permanently reduced job opportunities for these individuals 
and that as a result, there might be limited scope for participation to recover. Fortunately, the participation rate after 2015 consistently outperformed expectations. And by the beginning of 2020, the prime age participation rate had fully reversed its decline from the 2000 to 2000, 2008 to 2015 period. Moreover, gains in participation were concentrated among people without a college degree. Given that US labor force participation has lagged relative to other advanced economy nations, this progress was especially welcome. As I mentioned, we also saw faster wage growth for low earners once the labor market had strengthened sufficiently. Nearly six years into the recovery, wage growth for the lowest earning quartile had been persistently modest and well below the pace enjoyed by other workers. At the tipping point of 2015, however, as the labor market continued to strengthen, the trend reversed with wage growth for the lowest quartile consistently and significantly exceeding that of other workers. At the end of 2015, the black unemployment rate was still quite elevated at 9%, despite the relatively low overall unemployment rate. But that disparity too began to shrink. As the expansion continued beyond 2015, black unemployment reached a historic low of 5.2%, and the gap between black and white unemployment rates was the narrowest since 1972, when data on unemployment by race started to be collected. Black unemployment has tended to rise more than overall unemployment in recessions, but also to fall more quickly in expansions. Over the course of a long expansion, these persistent disparities can decline significantly, but without policies to address their underlying causes, they may increase again, when the economy, economy ultimately turns down. These late-breaking improvements in the labor market did not result in unwanted upward pressures on inflation as might have been expected. In fact, inflation did not even rise to 2% on a sustained basis. There was every reason to expect that the labor market could have strengthened even further without causing a worrisome increase in inflation were it not for the onset of the pandemic. The state of our labor market today could hardly be more different. Despite the surprising speed of the recovery early on, we are still very far from a strong labor market whose benefits are broadly shared. Employment in January of this year was nearly 10 million below its February 2020 level, a greater shortfall than the worst of the Great Recession's aftermath. After rising to 14.8% in April of last year, the published unemployment rate has fallen relatively swiftly, reaching 6.3% in January. But published unemployment rates during COVID have dramatically understated the deterioration in the labor market. Most importantly, the pandemic has led to the largest 12-month decline in labor force participation since at least 1948. Fear of the virus, and the disappearance of employment opportunities in the sectors most affected by it, such as restaurants, hotels, and entertainment venues, have led many to withdraw from the workforce. At the same time, virtual schooling has forced many parents to leave the workforce to provide all day care for their children. All told, nearly 5 million people say the pandemic prevented them from looking for work in January. In addition, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that many unemployed individuals have been misclassified as unemployed. Correcting this misclassification and counting those who have left the labor force since last February as unemployed would boost the unemployment rate to close to 10% in January. Unfortunately, even those grim statistics understate the decline in labor market conditions for the most economically vulnerable Americans. Aggregate employment has declined 6.5% since last February, but the decline in employment for workers in the top quartile of the wage distribution has been only 4%, while the decline for the bottom quartile has been a staggering 17%. Moreover, employment for these workers has changed little in recent months, while employment for the higher wage groups has continued to improve. Similarly, the unemployment rate for Blacks and Hispanics have risen significantly more than for whites since February 2020. As a result, economic disparities that were already too wide have widened further. In the past few months, improvement in labor market conditions stalled as the rate of infections sharply increased. In particular, 
Jobs in the leisure and hospitality sector dropped over a half million in December and a further 61,000 in January. The recovery continues to depend on controlling the spread of the virus, which will require mass vaccinations in addition to continued vigilance in social distancing and mask wearing in the meantime. <clears throat> Since the onset of the pandemic, we've been concerned about its longer run effects on the labor market. Extended periods of unemployment can inflict persistent damage on lives and lively livelihoods, while also eroding the productive capacity of the economy. And we know from the previous expansion that it can take many years to reverse the damage. At the start of the pandemic, the increase in unemployment was almost entirely due to temporary job losses temporarily laid off workers tend to return to work much more quickly on average than those whose ties to their former employers are permanently severed. But as some sectors of the economy have continued to struggle, permanent job loss has increased. So too has long-term unemployment. Still, as of January, the level of permanent job loss as a fraction of the labor force was considerably smaller than during the Great Recession. Research shows that the Paytech, pay Paycheck Protection Program has played an important role in limiting permanent layoffs and preserving small businesses. The renewal of this program this year in the face of another surge in COVID-related job cuts is an encouraging development. <clears throat> of course, in a healthy market-based economy, perpetual churn will always render some jobs obsolete as they are replaced by new employment opportunities. Over time, workers and capital move from firm to firm and from sector to sector. It is likely that the pandemic has both increased the need for such movements and brought forward some movement that would have occurred eventually. So how do we get from where we are today back to a strong labor market that benefits all Americans and that starts to heal the damage already done? And what can we do to sustain those benefits over time? Experience tells us that getting to and staying at full employment will not be easy. In the near term, policies that bring the pandemic to an end as soon as possible are paramount. In addition, workers and households who struggle to find their place in the post-pandemic economy are likely to need continued support. The same is true for many small businesses that are likely to prosper again once the pandemic is behind us. Also important is a patiently accommodative monetary policy stance that embraces the lessons of the past about the labor market in particular and the economy more generally. <clears throat> I described several of those important lessons as well as our new policy framework at the Jackson Hole Conference last year. I've already mentioned the broad-based benefits that a strong labor market can deliver and noted that many of these benefits only arose toward the end of the previous expansion. I also noted that these benefits were achieved with low inflation. Indeed, inflation has been much lower and more stable over the past three decades than in earlier times. In addition, we have seen that the longer run potential growth rate of the economy appears to be lower than it once was, in part because of population aging, and that the neutral rate of interest, or the rate consistent with the economy being at full employment with 2% inflation, is also much lower than before. <clears throat> A low neutral rate means that our policy rate will be constrained more often by the effect of lower bound. That circumstance can lead to worse economic outcomes, particularly for the most economically vulnerable Americans. To take these economic developments into account, we made substantial revisions to our monetary policy framework as described in the FOMC's Statement on Longer Run Goals and Monetary Policy Strategy. This revised statement shares many features with, with its predecessor, including our view that longer run inflation of 2% is most consistent with our mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability. But it also has some innovations. The revised statement emphasizes that maximum employment is a broad and inclusive goal. This change reflects our appreciation for the benefits of a strong labor market, particularly for many in low and moderate income communities. Recognizing the economy's ability to sustain a robust job market without causing an unwanted increase in inflation, the statement says that our policy decisions will be informed by our assessments of the shortfalls of employment from its maximum level, rather than by deviations from its maximum level. This means that we will not tighten monetary policy solely in response to a strong labor market. Finally, to counter the adverse economic dynamics that could ensue from declines in inflation expectations in an environment where our main policy tool is more frequently constrained, 
we now explicitly seek to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. This means that following periods when inflation has been running persistently below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time in the service of keeping inflation expectations well anchored at our 2% longer run goal. Our January post-meeting statement on monetary policy implements this new framework. In particular, we expect that it will be appropriate to maintain the current accommodative target range of the federal funds rate until labor market conditions have reached levels consistent with maximum employment and inflation has risen to 2% and is on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. In addition, we will continue to increase our holdings of treasury securities and agency mortgage-backed securities by $80 billion and $40 billion per month, respectively, until substantial further progress has been made toward our maximum employment and price stability goals. 75 years ago, in the wake of World War II, the United States faced the challenge of re-employing millions amid a major restructuring of the economy toward peacetime ends. Part of Congress's response was the Employment Act of 1946, which states that it is the continuing policy and responsibility of the federal government to use all practicable means to promote maximum employment. As later amended in the Humphrey Hawkins Act, this provision formed the basis of the employment side of the Fed's dual mandate. My colleagues and I are strongly committed to doing all we can to promote this employment goal. Given the number of people who have lost their jobs, and the likelihood that some will struggle to find work in the post-pandemic economy. Achieving and sustaining maximum employment will require more than supportive monetary policy. It will require a society-wide commitment with contributions from across government and the private sector. The potential benefits of investing in our nation's workforce are immense. Steady employment provides more than a regular paycheck. It also bestows a sense of purpose, improves mental health, increases lifespans and benefits workers and their families. I'm confident that with our collective efforts across the government and the private sector, our nation will make sustained progress toward our national goal of maximum employment. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for sharing your insights and, and your service to our country. Um, we'll now move to the question and answer portion of our program. We've got two superb questioners today from, from the club. Uh, we have the Economic Club of New York's Vice Chair and W.R. Berkeley Professor of Economics and Finance and Dean Emeritus of NYU Stern School of Business, Peter Blair Henry. And we have club board member and Robert M. Barron, Professor of Economics at Harvard University, Greg Mankiw. So I'm going to turn over the floor to the three of you. And I think, Peter, you'll, you have the first question to kick it off. Thank you, President Williams. And thank you, Chairman Powell, for a broad and very insightful set of remarks that I think really framed uh, very well for us the importance of both returning to and staying at full employment uh, and its role in driving uh, broad-based and inclusive prosperity. And you've also mentioned, of course, the importance of health uh, <clears throat> in the return to full employment. So the question I'd like to ask you, Mr. Chairman, as you're well aware, uh, the American Recovery Act is currently being debated uh, fiercely inside and outside the halls of Congress. And one of the topics which is uh, been under much discussion is the extent to which, given that we are now below full employment and we have an, out, an output gap, given the numbers that are being uh, debated presently um, in the American Recovery Act and what the implications would be for the increase in GDP that we would see as a result of uh, these fiscal measures, what do you and your colleagues see in terms of the size of the gap we currently have in the economy at present? relative to the increase in GDP that would bring us closer to being at sort of the full employment level of output, given the, the, the numbers that are being thrown around? How much space is there? So, um, Peter, I guess I need to start by, uh, by saying that the, the question of um, how much to spend and, and what to spend it on, that's really one for Congress and the administration. Uh, and there's a discussion going on right now about those precise questions, and, and that's appropriate. So, but not really uh, appropriate for me or for the Fed really to to uh, try to get into that discussion. You know, we have very uh, important goals, and Congress asks us to achieve those goals and gives us independence to do so. But the other side of that is we should kind of stick to our knitting a little bit. So I'm I'm a, I'm a little reluctant to 
uh, to get into what is a clearly a, a very active debate. Um, I will say a couple of things. One, fiscal policy has been absolutely uh, uh, essential in this recovery. This was a very different kind of a, of, of a downturn, which really, uh, it wasn't that something was wrong with the internal workings of the economy. It just was this really natural disaster hit and, and people's incomes in many cases were just extinguished really quickly. So it was about income replacement. It's also now about stimulation of aggregate demand, but it wasn't really about a, a demand shortfall or some kind of imbalance in the economy. So fiscal policy really came through with the CARES Act and then followed up. And I would just say it, it is the essential tool for, for, this, for this situation. And you know, we, we, of course, will continue to support this uh, as far as we, uh, it, for as long as, as is needed with, with our tools. Uh, I guess I will also say that, you know, that measures of the, uh, of potential output uh, are there's a wide range of estimates, and I think it's hard it, it's hard to really. Uh, I talked about this at, at Jackson Hole actually a couple of years ago. Uh, you want to be careful with um, relying too much on real time estimates of potential output or the natural rate of unemployment for that matter, or for that matter, matter the neutral rate of interest. Uh, my, yeah, my question is 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 related. Um, as you pointed out in, in your remarks, Chair, Mr. Chairman, you the United States has not experienced significant problematic inflation for many years, because since I was a student in the 70s and early 80s, um, both all the monetary and fiscal stimulus uh, being applied right now, together with some supply chain disruptions from the pandemic, uh, some observers fear that we might experience inf problematic inflation as the economy recovers. For example, Larry Summers raised this possibility in a recent Washington Post column, which I'm sure you saw. Do you have any indicators of inflation, of future inflation that, that you watch particularly closely? Or are you just waiting to see actual inflation before the Fed starts to worry about it? You know, so, uh, Greg, as, as you would imagine, we, we monitor a very broad range of inflation indicators, both, both uh, in, uh, inflation expectations, where we actually have an index of common inflation expectations. So these are survey expectations or market-based break-evens and that sort of thing. Also, of course, PCE inflation is our chosen metric, but we do look at wages and other other means. So, of course, it's half of our mandate, and so we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, we do a lot, and we have a very strong group of of inflation economists, and it's one of our one of our major focuses. I'll, I'll just say, I think the bigger picture still is that we've seen, uh, as I mentioned, you know, three decades, a quarter of a century of lower and more stable inflation. And we've seen really the last decade uh, be uh, characterized by global disinflationary forces and large advanced economy nations struggling to reach their 2% inflation goal from below. Um, and I, so that I think is the broader setting. In addition, the pandemic itself has produced lower inflation readings uh, driven to, at the beginning by um, you know, by collapsing demand for for in certain particular services. Um, as we look forward, uh, as the very low readings of, of March and April of last year fall out of the 12 month window, we'll probably see an increase, uh, but it, it, it in in readings. But that's really not going to mean very much. You're going to see it, it it won't be very large or or, or persistent in all likelihood. It's just a function of of uh, of those readings falling out. Well, we also may see as the economy reopens, we may see a burst of spending. We don't know this, but it, many are are monitoring for that. If you if the economy reopens, there's quite a lot of savings on people's balance sheet. There's monetary policy. There's fiscal policy. You could see strong uh, strong spending growth, and and there could be some upward pressure on prices there. Again, though, uh, I, I, my expectation would be that 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 will be neither large nor sustained. We have had uh, inflation dynamics in our economy for, as I mentioned, three decades, which consist of a very flat Phillips curve, meaning, meaning a weak relationship between high resource utilization, low unemployment and inflation, but also low persistence of inflation critically. If you go back to when you and I were in college, um, you, you had a steep Phillips curve, but you also had the situation where if inflation went up, it would stay up because expectations were not anchored. And so people would expect inflation and that that would make it go up, mean that it went up. So um, those we have uh, very low persistence and a very flat Phillips curve. Now, those things are not permanent. Nothing in the economy is really permanent. It, 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 it will evolve over time. Inflation dynamics will evolve, but it's hard to 
make the case why they would evolve very suddenly in this current situation. So the last thing I'll say is you, you asked about actual inflation. So in fact, if you look at our, uh, I described our new framework and our, and our guidance, um, you know, in major part, we are looking at actual inflation. We wanna see actual inflation. And part of the reason for that is all during the long expansion, many of us, and that includes me, we're writing down a return to 2% inflation and maybe a mild overshoot year after year after year. And year after year after year, inflation fell short of that. So we have tied ourselves to, uh, to realizing actual inflation, for example. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's the way our rate guidance works is we'd have to see inflation reach 2%, not in a forecast, but, but actually. So we are looking at, at for actual inflation. The last thing I'll say is, of course, if contrary to expectations, inflation expectations were to move up in a troubling manner and that were to be sustained or if inflation were to be at troubling levels and, and that were to be sustained, then, then we have the tools to address that and, and we have, will of course use them. Sir Powell, you rightly talked about, and I think it's so important, the central role that health played in both precipitating this recession and the role that it's gonna play in the recovery. And as you think about all the, the data that you look at, and the changing nature of this 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 uh, this recession, are there specific health indicators that you are looking at, your colleagues are looking at, uh, as new indicators, uh, leading indicators of uh, of where uh, the economy is, is, is structurally in the recovery? Well, yes, you know, I think like uh, like many many people, uh, we're doing what other people are doing, which is um, trying to learn as much as possible about pandemics and and the spread of covid and and we you know we've been we talk to a lot of experts our staff are, are very plugged into outside experts and we all read a lot and you know I, I think you know it's it's just a very different um kind of set of data that we're looking at it's a very broad set of data and so and we've been learning of course so we saw the first you know the the the, imp, the original the initial impact in march and april when the economy was was largely shut down set all kinds of records for uh, you know, for a decline in in, uh, in employment and in economic activity. Then we had a spike in the South and the West in the summer. And, you know, I think in kind of uh, many of us were looking at that and thinking, oh, that'll leave a real mark on economic activity. And, and it was much less than expected. So as we've gone through the, and then the one in the fall, we expected a spike, the, the spike in the, in the winter fall, the late fall and, and winter has been very, very large. Of course, once again, big parts of the economy have just performed pretty well through that. If you look back at um, jobs have continued to be created in, in goods manufacturing and in many service areas. Of course, the places that are really directly affected by COVID are those that require people to gather together closely, uh, travel, entertainment, leisure, hotels, you know, all those things. And they are very strongly affected by it. So, um, so the, the last thing is, uh, so what we all love to do is read enough that we could actually look ahead and say, "I we know we know when herd immunity is going to get here." And the truth is, that's not really something that any of us can do. The, the the experts that we talk to will always say it depends. It's highly uncertain. So what we have in effect is a base case, which is fairly positive, uh, and and that is that we do reach herd immunity sometime in the middle of the year, and the economy is quite performs quite well in in the second half of the year. But you know. Our job, though, is not to is not to you know replace Dr. Fauci. It really is to understand the implications for the economy. And in this particular case, the risks seem to be to the downside from a slower rollout of the vaccination, or a less successful rollout of, of vaccination, or from the new the new strains. So we monitor all of that, and I think our, our view is that we need to guard against those downside risks and make sure that we don't move to modify our policy. In other words, to to even think about uh, withdrawing policy support until we see that we're really through the pandemic, because there's just so much uncertainty, and, and it's it's a it's a case where really look, a typical risk management approach to monetary policy, where you're looking at the base case, but you're actually managing to where the risks lie, which in this case we think are the downside. I agree with you that fiscal policy has been incredibly important over the past six nine months, um, and appropriately so. It's been very active, but. As a result of active fiscal policy, the federal government debt is now reaching historic highs as a percentage of GDP. Somewhat paradoxically, though, the, the budgetary cost of debt service is not high at all by historical standards. 
thanks to historically low interest rates. And that sort of brings me to the question, which is, might the impact of higher interest rates on the federal budget enter into the Fed's thinking about how quickly and how much to raise interest rates as the economy recovers? So I, the answer to that is clearly no. We're a long way from the situation where we would have to take into account the question of uh, the federal government's ability to finance itself. That, that's, that's in no way where we are. We, we, we set and we will continue to set our monetary policy stance to best achieve maximum employment and price stability. Federal budgetary issues do not enter and in, 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 do not play a role in, in our in our deliberations at all. As a completely separate matter, and this this so that's my answer to your question. As a completely separate matter, it, you know the the federal U.S. federal uh, budget is not on a fiscally sustainable path. That's been the case for a long time, and it's certainly the case now. That's different from saying that the level of debt is unsustainable. It's clearly not, as you mentioned. You've got low interest rates. My own view is fiscal authorities will need to return to this question, uh, and uh, the time to do that, though, is not now. When the economy is weak, when we have 10 million people unemployed, and and uh, uh, it's just not the right time to be focused on on uh, on addressing those issues. That time is when the economy is strong, unemployment is low, taxes are rolling, and that time will come. But but I would say it's not now. Sure, Paul. One of the things that we've learned over the last decade is that the Fed has more tools at its disposal than the textbooks uh, originally taught us. Uh, during the uh, financial crisis, as, as interest rates you know, approached zero, people uh, thought that the Fed was going to be sort of out of ammunition, and clearly the Fed has shown that it's not out of ammunition. And as you think about this important point you've made about the despair, growing disparities in the labor market, Certainly, returning to full employment and the strategy you've outlined for allowing the economy to uh, to, 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 to run uh, at, at full employment is one way of addressing those disparities. Is there thinking within the Fed about um, tools that are within clearly within your mandate uh, that are sort of more creative, if you will, that will help you think about uh, ways in which to... to um, more directly, if you will, address uh, these disparity issues other than the blunt instrument of just uh, just the federal funds rate? You know, um, so we're, we're an unusual organization because we have a very specific mandate and very powerful tools, important mandate. And we have this, this grant of independence, meaning that our, I mean, that under current law, our decisions can't be reversed and we have long terms and they're not synchronized with election cycles or, or anything like that. So, and that should be a rare, in, in, a, in, a, in a healthy functioning democracy, that should be rare because, you know, most things should be subjected to, uh, you know, to regular popular democracy. And, and so, and be, because of our unusual nature, of course, we, we work really hard to be transparent and find accountability and, and therefore de democratic legitimacy. This is, it's very important that we do that. But I think given, given the special, given our, our precious independence, which allows us to do things without regard to politics and without regard to political cycles, I think people generally understand that, that, that that's a good thing, that, that has, that's, a, that's a, an institutional arrangement that has served the public well. But the other side of that is we, we do not seek to, uh, to venture into what is effectively fiscal policy. When you're talking about targeting uh, groups who, who are very needy, very worthy, and targeting them with resources, that's fiscal policy. That's what you're elected to do. We, nobody elected us. And so I, I feel like we, it's very important that we stick to uh, our assignment from Congress, maximum employment, price stability. Well, of course, we're also involved in bank regulation, the payment system, and other things. Uh, but I, I do think we're not, the tools you describe really are tools of fiscal policy specifically. And I, I, we, do, we do not seek them. I mean, I, th I think we, we should stick with what we're doing and let the fiscal authorities do what they do. It's a very important point you made. I asked the question as a teacher because I think it's important for people to understand the distinction between what the Fed does and what, the, what other people might like the Fed to do. Very important. I agree, Peter. Since you brought up the issue of transparency, I'd love to ask a question about that. Now, transparency is obviously something that can have different degrees, and everybody's in favor of transparency. But some people take transparency to a very far extreme. I mean, I, the most extreme case I can think of is Ray Dalio's firm that literally has every conversation recorded and posted so everybody can see everybody talking to everybody else. 
I presume you wouldn't want that degree of transparency at the Fed. I've wondered in talking to former Federal Reserve governors whether the, tra the transparency rules have, been, have gone too far in some cases to make it hard for governors to have informal meetings among themselves. <laughs> do, do you think we've some, it's in some dimensions maybe we've gone too far in, tra in, in, for, um, in requiring transparency there for making it hard for the, the Fed to have private conversations? I guess I guess I would say it this way. Uh, there, there are some aspects of the transparency scheme broadly that are that that I, if I had a blank sheet of paper, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do them that way. And you, you mentioned government in the sunshine and we can't get we can only have a certain number of governors. And, and, and that's and so that's that's not great. And actually, we got a waiver of that during the during the acute phase of the crisis. We got a legal waiver in the first I guess the first CARES Act. So and that enabled us to not have to worry about that, be able to talk. So I, I do think that that is uh, challenging, you know, the, if for, for the six governors to have lunch together, we have to just be super careful. And, you know, it's like, anyway, but but I will say that by and large, I think the transparency, the, the move to far greater transparency really over the last almost 30 years now, high 20s, uh, has really served the public well and and is appropriate in our, in our uh, system of government. You know, we we are so transparent now, and I, by the way, we keep finding new ways to be transparent, and I, I think it works. You know, we're 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 very focused on uh, on, on my colleagues and I are on on engaging with uh, those who have oversight over us in our form of government, and that's the legislature in our form of government. In, in many others, it's the finance ministry, but here, that's who has oversight. So we're up there a lot. That's more transparency, more more press conferences, more reports, and I think it generally has been a very successful program. Over doesn't that's not to say though, as, as you point out, that there are a couple of things that I would, in the dark of night or or otherwise, be, be willing to change. Sir sure, Paul, I'd like to talk for a second about through the global economy. Every central bank has its particular mandate and is of course focused on uh, doing the best to, to fulfill that mandate for uh, its its domestic economy, but central banks are also in constant communication with with one another. Um, to make sure that uh, we're doing things in a way that doesn't uh, undermine uh, kind of global prosperity. Could you talk a bit about um, the con any, anything you can share with us about how you're thinking about global uh, policy coordination at the moment? And maybe on a more personal level, how challenging is that at the moment, given that you're not seeing your colleagues in person? So I, I, it's, um, I, I didn't, uh, until I became chair, I didn't realize how much of the job or how much time is is invested in you know in developing those relationships and in being in regular communication with with uh, other central bankers and other policymakers around the world it really is it's very important and and you saw and as the co as the covid event really demonstrated these developments economic and financial market developments they often have global implications and so um, you know the channels that we develop during during more peaceful times become very, very important. So, you know, and that means, so, but you're right. We, you know, we go to Basel six times a year for maybe three, four days and, and meet. And there are, there are a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, smaller meetings. And then there are, there are group meetings and, you know, it's just extremely useful to hear from other central bankers, what really is happening, what really are their concerns. And it, it does inform our understanding of what may happen with our economy, and, and as I mentioned, it, it really puts us in a situation where, when things go wrong, we know each other and we can talk on the phone, which we did a lot. It's it's, and so we're still having all those Basel calls and other calls, G7, G20 calls. They're all calls now. They're not meetings, and you know because you sort of have a stored up amount of goodwill and knowledge of each other, and and we're we're still doing that. And it's still effective, I would say, but yes, it's not the same. You know, the difference is. You can have a you can have the Basel meetings on on the telephone, but you won't have the you know the the time having lunch and and just seeing each other in the halls and that kind of thing for for three days. So um, it, it's it's you know a, a very important aspect, and I think the activities really do help us do our jobs better in serving the American public. After the Great Recession and the um, pandemic recession that we're just getting out of now, the Fed balance sheet is vastly different, much larger than it was, say, 15 years ago. Um, now, I know this is not the time to, to shrink it. Uh, you're not. Uh, but, but look at past this the current crisis and look ahead where we might be 15 years from now. 
Do you envision um, the Fed going back to a smaller balance sheet, having a more modest role in financial markets as it did in the past? Or do you think we're in a new world where this expanded balance sheet is a permanent fixture uh, of the financial system? I, I do want to begin by agreeing with your with your first point, which is um, uh, the economy is far away from maximum employment and stable prices, and and the balance sheet will be the size that it needs to be to provide support to the economy. And as you know, we're currently buying assets, and uh, it's a key part of what we're doing in providing overall uh, uh, accommodation to the economy. That is our focus. We're not thinking about shrinking the balance sheet. Just to be clear, I, I just want to make sure that that's out there. But to, to get to your real question, in the long run, our balance sheet will be no larger than it needs to be uh, to meet the demand for our liabilities and allow us to implement monetary policy effectively and efficiently. So it, it really is, in the long run, it's demand for our liabilities, which are the two biggest of which are currency and reserves. So when we, when we buy assets, we're, we're really thinking about buying assets, but in the, what, when when the, the pool of assets declines over many years, as it did after the global financial crisis, um, it really is the public's demand for our liabilities. So we will return to a place gradually with tons of transparency and, and not beginning anytime soon to a place where really the size of our balance sheet is set by the public's demand for our liabilities. It won't be the $20 billion balance sheet that we had in 2005. It won't because, and that partly is just that growth of demand for currency has been surprisingly high in a, in, at a time when in many other parts of the world, uh, people are declining to use currency. Demand for reserves though, reserves are you know, the most liquid uh, uh, asset and, and they're in high demand for, for banks to meet their liquidity requirements and, and payment uh, utilities and all that. So. Um, Longer run, though, I, I, so we will get back to that. And, and uh, you know, we, we did um, ultimately do that after the global financial crisis. We, we froze the size of the balance sheet in 2014. And then as the economy grows, the balance sheet shrinks as a percent of GDP. In addition, reserves decline as, uh, as currency and other liabilities sort of organically grow. So, but again, these are, these are longer term uh, uh, so the answer to your question is yes, with a with a long explanation, I would say. I want to come back to a point that you uh, briefly alluded to in your remarks today, um, and alluded and mentioned a bit more a couple of years ago in Jackson Hole about the natural rate of interest. And of course, as you pointed out, we're a long way away from full em employment. But as you just as you as you and your colleagues think about the longer term and think about where the natural rate of interest is, where uh, financially determined interest rates are. And in some sense, the underlying rate of return on capital in the in the economy. One of the things that's been, I think, a bit puzzling has been why we haven't had much of a as much of an investment recovery um, as we would have had in the past, uh, given these levels of interest rates. And obviously, there's a pandemic, there's a financial crisis. But I'm just wondering whether you and your colleagues have thought uh, a bit more about um, about the long term outlook for 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 real investment. And, um, and, and what role that will play in particular as you think about these, uh, these labor market issues that you talked about. Yeah, so actually in the, in the last, you know, <clears throat> the last part of the recovery here over the last few months, we've actually seen uh, a, a nice bounce in, in investment, and, uh, equipment and intangibles, and of course, residential, and uh, not so much in, in structures, mm -hmm. but you've seen, you've seen a strong bounce, uh, you know, in, in um, investment which is which is nice because it's you know it's important in driving productivity over time you know there there is a as you know there's a school of thought that um that the requirements for investment that it w will be less and that's one of the reasons why the rate is so low mm -hmm. that you know you're 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 balancing savings and investment and to the extent you know savings the extent investment is is low that the rate on the on savings is going to be is going to have to be lower. The interest rate will be lower, neutral rate of interest. So um, that's a longer term question and, and a very good one. As you know, as the things we're investing in weigh less and maybe cost less, and technology advances, it does it does have implications for lower lower and lower interest rates. And I think we're experiencing some of that now. Um, over the past dozen years or so, the Fed and the Treasury have worked very closely together. Um, 
to support the economy, uh, largely productively, I think. Um, and now we have a treasury secretary that's a former Fed chair, which is uh, an unusual circumstance. So really how, how do you think about that? Do you think this is gonna mean, mean we're gonna have continued collaboration higher collaboration between the Fed and Treasury than we've had maybe in historically. Uh, do you, is there any risk that this, that collaboration could threaten Fed independence? Or maybe the fact that it was a former Fed chair's Treasury Secretary will bolster Fed independence, because I'm sure Janet's a big believer in it, and maybe she'll help protect the Fed you know, if there's any political pressure. So I was wondering how you sort of think about the Fed-Treasury relationship in this current environment. Yeah, so I guess I'd start with the fact that um... You know, these are these are long time institutional relationships and you know we have different authorities and different roles and i would say institutionally there's great respect for those differences on both sides and that that's a pre-existing state of affairs in addition it's uh, it's the case that finance ministries and central bank have central banks have ongoing communication and in some cases collaboration in particular circumstances around the world on an ongoing basis. And it, it, in, it's, it, it hasn't at all uh, amounted to uh, any kind of a threat to Fed independence. And it becomes much more important during times of crisis. And in particular, um, uh, you know this, in, in the global financial crisis, the Fed used our emergency 13-3 lending authority to, to very successful effect. And then Dodd-Frank in the aftermath uh, change the law so that uh, any facility started under that emergency lending authority needs the approval of the treasury secretary. I think that's good government. You know, that's that's basically uh, putting the elected branch of the government in a position of accountability for these truly extraordinary circumstances and the actions that are taken. In any case, it's the law. Uh, and so, and I think we worked very successfully under that new legal structure. And I think as long as those powers are, uh, are, are really reserved for unusual circumstances like that, I, I don't really see uh, a, a threat to Fed independence. I mean, my, my own experience is that, that uh, basically the idea that a central bank needs a degree of independence from the political process, from election cycles, is very well understood and, and widely agreed to on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the hill. And it's rare to find someone who doesn't actually get that. And this doesn't mean that the Fed won't come under a lot of criticism during uh, difficult economic times and things like that. That will happen. But ultimately, I think it's an institutional arrangement that has served the public well. And I think that's well understood. Um, and I certainly expect that that will continue to be the case uh, uh, in, in the current administration. One of the nice things about these events is we get questions uh, from members ahead of time. I'd like to... Um, to ask you a question that was sent in, sent in by a member. As he knows, President Williams mentioned we have a number of students in the audience. And one of the members wrote in and asked, um, you know, you've had this incredibly distinguished career and you've had a chance to see uh, lots of different uh, kinds of people, policymakers, business people. Um, the question is, uh, my, my son, says the member, is uh, in college and is studying business and economics. What advice do you have, Chairman Powell, a young person studying business and economics who wants to wants to uh, be an economist in the future. What have you what have you what have you seen that you chair? Interesting question. Pretty pretty broad. So I, I would just say this. Um, I, I can only speak from my own experience, and that is uh, I wanted to have a career that involved. Um, I grew up in Washington D.C. Right, but, but and my family was not at all connected to the big political doings or anything like that. But they were around, you know. And that that was happening around us. Uh, and so I, I wanted to have a private sector, mostly private sector career, but I wanted to serve in the government and serve the public at different intervals in my in my year. And, and frankly, the, 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 the two people that I thought of were George Schultz, who just passed away at age 100, and Cyrus Vance, who's a, who is another one who was he was a lawyer in New York. He was secretary of state. So I thought that was a great career model. And, and by some amazing quirk that's that's kind of what happened for me you know and i i would just say uh that's that's a very unusual the united states system is very unusual in that it welcomes people from the private sector openly to come in and serve and then go back and go back to their their lives in most you know democracies parliamentary democracies you're, you either have a career in public service, which is great. They're great public servants, but you don't have so, so many cases of people wanting to come in and serve for three or four years. So, and I, I think that adds a perspective and 
keeps the the, the government uh, more grounded in what's going on out there. And I, of course, I would think that, but uh, you know, I, I think that's that's the advice I was is consider. Don't just consider your your own the advancement of your own career, but consider how you can also do public service. And um, that's that's one thing I, I would certainly. The, the second thing is think big. I would say people, you know, no, looking back at the, the 45 plus years since I graduated from college, the opportunities, the things that were happening, you know, people are walking by me on, on the Princeton campus, Meg Whitman, Jeff Bezos, they thought big. I mean, so those, they, those, those were, you know, those were people, they were there after I was, but, you, but think big, big things can happen. Uh, big things are possible. Great advice. Okay, so that question motivates my, 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 my next one. Um, so let's, let's think big. Let, let's imagine that your, your, your next job is not uh, Fed chair, but is a member of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> would, would there be a particular issue you would want to champion? Are there things that, big, big problems out there that we, we, we aren't addressing as a nation that you think are, really, are, are high priorities that, that we, we should be focused on? No, 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 I don't, and I'm going to transcend the current pandemic because we all agree getting vaccines out there and getting people healthy again is, is job one. But sort of let's, let's, let's put ourselves ahead six months or something where we have herd, herd immunity and we're getting back on track. What are sort of the big challenges as a nation that you think um, our, our leaders, broadly speaking, not just monetary policy leaders, but broadly speaking, should be focused on? I think, I think there are a lot of them, but, but one I will mention that connects more to our work here <clears throat> is just, uh, and this, can, this is also in my speech, um, it would be great if we had a, a national strategy to have the U.S. Econ- to, to, to make the U.S. economy as big and as as the prosperity that the United States economy has as broadly shared as possible, and to have that economy be as big as it can possibly be. In other words, the productive capacity of the economy. So part of that is investing in the labor force. Part of it is having a, you know t- a tax code and regulatory policy that promotes growth. Growth is what enables incomes to rise generation upon generation, and we we want so we want growth to be high. We also want it to be very widely spread. So that and I I just it's people come to Washington, they work on all these hot political issues, but we don't take a step back and say, okay, what is the supply side strategy that we need as a country to maximize the potential growth of the United States economy and also the distribution of that, the, you know, the, 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 the more, uh, more broadly inclusive prosperity. So those are the things I would really want to work with, work on if I were, if I were an elected representative. Some of those things. If I could just follow, follow up on that. I think it's really interesting to your, your point about productivity. As you've had a chance to observe lots and lots of data, hear lots and lots of conversations amongst your colleagues about the various things that are driving productivity or not driving productivity as the case may be, are there things that stand out in your mind as um, either for you particularly or amongst your colleagues more generally that are bottlenecks to achieving that kind of long run productivity growth that you're talking about that we that we need to drive sustained prosperity? Well, I mean, we we no longer have a uh, a lot of or have a much smaller program for basic research in the federal government. A lot of the basic research we were doing in wartime and and during the you know, during the, um, the the space programs, it actually wound up benefiting the country a lot. I'm also I am a believer in you know a, a fairly well known model of which is the the sort of um, skill biased uh, technological change model. Uh, two of Greg's colleagues at Harvard are, wrote the book, uh, um, the race between education and technology, and I, I think there's a lot in that. In other words, it, it, what what evolving technology wants is it wants people with skills and aptitudes to benefit, to operate it and benefit from it. And if, if those people are there, then you can have a rising tide that lifts all boats. You can have rapidly evolving technology and actually declining inequality. And we had that for many years, but U.S. educational attainment plateaued relative to those of our peers. And I think that, that explains lower growth, explains lower productivity, also explains just maldistribution of income. So because you have people who, who really haven't had much in the, in the way of real wage increases since I graduated from college 45 years ago. And you have others whose income, you know, their, their place in the income spectrum at the high end has gone up by 500%. And that's, I think that is one of the basic explanations is that our educational system has not kept up with the needs of 
of a, of, a, of a technologically advancing economy. And if it does that, then you can have more prosperity and can be more broadly, uh, more broadly shared. Okay, one last question before I turn it back over to uh, John Williams. Is your job fun? <laughs> yes, it is. I, I love my job. And, uh, you know, it's a chance to, to do work that, that I think helps people. I have great colleagues and, uh, yeah, I, and the subject matter is endlessly interesting and important, and uh, I, I really, I really do enjoy the work. Well, thank you, Chairman Powell. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, thanks, John. Hey. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Hey, well, uh, thanks, Jay, both for the speech and the very insightful discussion on a wide range of issues. And I, I really liked uh, the last question. Uh, and uh, but the other thing, you know, uh, and thanks, Peter and, and Greg. I, I, I love the fact that we get questions from from the students. And I know, Greg, you've invited your students to participate uh, to to uh, uh, watch uh, uh, this event. I think this has been like a, you know, a great classroom to see, you know, how uh, you know, Chair Powell, you view the economy, think about policy, think about the Fed independence and so many other, uh, uh, you know, really important uh, topics. Um, so again, thanks to every, uh, every one of you for participating in today's event. Um, now it is my job uh, in the last minute or two to uh, uh, mention that we've got more uh, great events uh, lined up. Uh, we encourage you to invite uh, to both attend and invite guests uh, to these events. So on Friday, we got Peter Orzag, Bob Rubin, and Joe Stiglitz uh, and uh, uh, speaking about uh, their recent uh, uh, work. Uh, on February 17th, we have Mark Tessier Levine, the president of uh, Stanford University, uh, and then staying on the West uh, Coast uh, for a few weeks. On March 2nd, we have Mary Daly, president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And then we're gonna come back uh, uh, tor towards the East Coast, and we're going to have uh, City uh, CEO Jane Fraser and G GM CEO uh, Mary Barra joining us on March 11th as part of a Women in Business uh, conference. So we'll be uh, providing more details on those events and many more to come. So again, everybody, thank you for uh, attending this uh, event, and please um, keep your eyes out for the announcements for future events. So stay healthy, stay safe.